We will call this meeting to order. And this is Tuesday, August 13th, and this is uh, the CIP budget hearings. And I'd like to welcome those out in the audience and those that will be pre presenting to us. What? Sure it is. It's on. Can't you hear me? No. Okay, I'll speak louder. Anyway, uh, before we get going here, I'd just like to remind everybody that we do have a work session scheduled for Thursday. And so far at our work session, it will start from 3 o'clock and probably till 5 o'clock thereabouts. Uh, and topics in the work session so far will be transit. Uh, we will also discuss the city council travel policy uh, at that time. And at this point in time, we really don't have anything else that is on that work session. One thing that the counselors will have in front of them is the new procedures manual. And I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Aguilar and, uh, uh, and Erpenbach for leading the process on, our, uh, on this operations ma manual, and this is for the City Council. Uh, in, included in there, we have reworked, and we do have some suggestions, and we will have some discussions on uh, Thursday about the City uh, Council travel po policy and a possible resolution uh, that we're going to bring forward at some time, too. So we will discuss that at Thursday's meeting. Um, with that, I believe, uh, Tracy, if I could have you come forward. Uh, Director Turbach, uh, we do have a question from Councillor Karski. Thank you, Councillor Henneman. Uh, Tracy, it was reported in the uh, paper this week that we're looking at a 4.9 million FEMA reimbursement. And I know the Project Timber Strike cost us somewhere north of 11 million, if I'm correct. Um, will the, the anticipated reimbursement from FEMA being, it seems less than what we were probably anticipating, what effect will that have on our general operating budget? When we looked last week, you show us our numbers going forward and how close we were getting to that 25%. Will this impact that, were those numbers already factored in there? What can you tell me? Sure, I can, I can do my best to respond to that. The uh, Tracy Turback with the Finance Office. Um, the, as I recall, the information that we had provided to you earlier uh, had put the total or estimated total at about $9 million um, for the, the entire Operation Timber Strike. The, uh, the, the recent announcement on the $4.9 million is a partial reimbursement, and that really reflects just the federal funding. So there have been uh, a number of other smaller ones, I think a couple smaller ones on different categories of, of uh, cost that have already been processed. The 4.9 relates to a big chunk of the costs related to the debris removal. And so there will be more to come. Uh, the, the process isn't finished yet. And in addition to the, uh, the 4.9, there's also would be an additional 10% 10, 10 from the state on top of that as well. So I think for the most part, we are very much on track where we expect it to be uh, in relation to the FEMA reimbursement. They've made some minor adjustments and disallowed some, some really minor amounts on a couple different things. But uh, overall, I think we're sitting, sitting very well in terms of getting what we had anticipated uh, uh, a month or two ago. Okay, thank you. So I guess the, to, to really get to your question, that we sh it shouldn't really have any, any additional impact uh, other than what we talked about. I think I mentioned last week we expected about 1.2 million thereabouts to be the local share of uh, the final tally. Yeah. Councillor Staggers. Yes, um, 4.9 million. Um, that seems to be quite a small amount in comparison to the what we've been talking about before, I think it was 11 million and all this. How are we on track? Well, we're only part way through the process in terms of the receiving and processing the reimbursements. We haven't even incurred all the costs yet. We continue to incur costs for grinding a lot of the debris and disposing of it. So the, we're, we're only part way through the process in terms of submitting costs to FEMA and having them reviewed and, and approved and uh, payment issued. So the, the, the uh, 4.9 million uh, that was, was mentioned in the paper is 75% of about 6.6 .6 million that was submitted as one package or one submittal to FEMA. And so we're, uh, we received uh, uh, what we expected, essentially, uh, as they say, with some very minor adjustments. But there will be additional costs that are, are submitted and processed by FEMA uh, before everything is said and done. 
So what percentage do you think we have submitted to FEMA already? Yes, I don't have a good handle on that. I know there are some, some invoices and bills that we haven't even received yet. So, uh, and I, as I mentioned uh, a moment ago, there are some other costs too that were submitted uh, for some of the uh, emergency response, the overtime and those things have already been submitted and processed and payments been received for those as expected. So like I say, we're, in my opinion, very much on track with uh, what we had expected. Okay, thank you. Yes, Councilor Anderson. Tracy, when will you be able to give us an update on what has already been processed and uh, what else you expect to be processed after this for 4.9 million? Okay, well, we can sure put something together for you as a kind of an update. I'm not sure how quickly we'll, we'll have a chance to get back in front of you, but we can, we can do that in the near future. If it could be even by email, I... Sure. I that think might the be an easy, much easier like way to, to do it. some of the numbers. Okay, we'll put something together and get it out in an email then. Great. Thank you. Any other questions for Director Turbeck? Okay, thanks, Tracy. Thank you. That being said, over this budget hearing, we're going to cover Parks and Recs. We're going to cover the Great Plains Zoo, the Washington Pavilion Arts and Science, and Public Works, and we're going to kick it off with Parks and Rec. Don. Good afternoon, City Council members. Don Kearney with Parks and Recreation. Uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity once again to visit with you about our proposed operating capital budget for 2014. Uh, before I start, though, I certainly would like to recognize our staff that were involved in putting the budget together. Uh, they do a lot of the number crunching for us. Uh, I'd like to recognize Dave Fisher, Alicia Luther, uh, Dee Cordles, uh, Kelby Maris, and Tori for their hard work in putting this together. It uh, takes a, a group effort to pull it all together. And I'd also like to recognize Krista Stussy. Uh, Krista is with finance, and she's our uh, designated financial analyst that uh, we worked in collaboration in putting the budget together. So thanks to, to all of them. To start out with, I wanted to give you a department overview. Um, we currently have 75 developed parks and 15 undeveloped parks, totaling more than 3,000 acres of parkland. And then we also maintain 1,800 acres of other public properties. This includes everything from drainage ways and street medians to grounds ma maintenance at our libraries and water tower sites. The parks and rec system consists of over, of over $200 million in fixed assets spread across 74 square miles. The other thing I wanted to touch on today is a little bit about urban forestry. Uh, obviously this year was a, a significant challenge for our forestry division uh, due to the spring ice storm. And certainly looking back at that ice storm, we're certainly thankful for your support for our urban forestry programs, whether it be our street tree removal program or project trim. Uh, I think next time mother nature decides to really test our tree resources again, we'll be glad that we had those programs in place uh, because I think it helps to minimize the damage that happens when we do have a, a severe event. Uh, in 2012, we licensed 42 arborists. Uh, we're very confident that that number is going to be significantly more in 2013 uh, because of all the private contractors that came into town and got licensed. And so I uh, spent a lot of time doing that. And then uh, Prior to uh, the ice storm, uh, our trend over the last five years is that the number of complaints uh, related to trees have been trending downward. Uh, Dwayne tells me that that number is going to go up significantly. Uh, one of the things we're finding, as you probably remember, when the ice storm happened, we had a lot of trees that were lean no, leaning over or completely bent over. Some of those have not fully uprighted, and so we're having some, some challenges with that, and it's generating some calls. and so. Uh, we think that number is going to be uh, trending back upward at least for a year or so. Uh, in addition to the nearly 5,000 acres that we maintain, we've got three municipal golf courses. Uh, we've got a great new arboretum. And then we also have a, an additional phase of River Greenway to celebrate. And then we also operate five community centers, four enlarged gyms, and eight aquatic facilities across the city. Uh, previously, in previous years, we had about 32 athletic associations that we uh, provide facilities for and support and co collaborate with. We now have 36. Uh, pickleball is a new one uh, that's uh, gained in popularity. Uh, the single track, uh, the Leaders Park single track uh, group uh, is another one. And so we continue to have partnerships with all those different user groups. 
In 2012, total attendance and participation in our park system that we're actually able to track exceeded 2.8 million. In all, uh, our proposed budget invests 36.1 million in 2014, and that number includes both operating and capital. Now specifically, I wanted to talk through our capital program and some of the key projects that we plan to complete in 2014. Uh, funding for a new out, outdoor, or excuse me, an indoor aquatic center is certainly the centerpiece of our capital program in 2014. Um, we have budgeted to build an indoor aquatic center based on the consultant's recommendations included in the aquatic facility master plan that was conducted earlier this year. Also wanted to talk to you a little bit more about timing as far as a, it goes for an indoor aquatic uh, center and the key activities. Um, that, and this would all happen post-election in 2014, assuming we move forward, uh, and that's currently what we have in our capital program. Um, in 2014, we would initiate and complete the schematic design. Uh, we would adopt a board bond ordinance. Uh, we would select a construction manager at risk, much like we've done out at the zoo uh, for those types of projects, as well as the event center. Uh, we'd initiate design development, and then we would bid those initial contracts as they were ready to go, and then we would initiate construction, uh, conceivably in 2014. Uh, in 2015, we complete the design development, we'd bid the remaining contracts, sell the bonds, and continue construction, and then in 16, we would complete the construction and then ultimately open the facility. And so uh, we wanted to provide that timeline with, for you as it relates to the reason why we have the dollars uh, for construction of the facility in 2014. Some of the other projects, uh, highlights in 2014 will include the uh, construction on the re and renovations to Lion Park located at 14th and Phillips. We'll also di design improvements, uh, including the design and construction of a new restroom on uh, the west side of Falls Park, the older restroom that we have on that west side, and, uh, and design improvements uh, to Falls Park at West. And then we also plan to put a new roof on the home team clubhouse at the Sioux Falls Stadium. And then as always, uh, throughout that capital program, we have dollars in our budget to continue to invest in improving and maintaining those existing parks and recreation facilities. Under operating budget, as proposed, it's at 14.9 million. 8.7 of that is in personnel, and 6.2 is in other operating. So how did we get from 14.3 million in 2013 to 14.9 million in 2014? Uh, large part of that includes um, wages and benefits that were non-discretionary, um, inflationary increases for utilities and pools and grounds maintenance like cost of chlorine, grass seed and fertilizer. Uh, we also had some service-based volume increases including maintenance services and supplies for new facilities like the Arboretum and the River Greenway. We also had some true ups for major expenses in the past that are no longer included in the 2014 budget, like the Sound and Light Show and the new Season Pass software, hardware, and wireless connections associated with the new uh, Season Pass system that we implemented this year. We will continue to uh, invest about $2 million in supporting the YMCA after school middle school program Volunteers of America about Bowden Youth Center, Centers for Active Generations, and annual operating support for the zoo. Uh, some of the initiatives in our budget this year include part-time rate and hour increases to be able to attract and retain seasonal employees and also maintain uh, new facilities that we brought online. Uh, we also uh, have some dollars in our budget to mail additional activities guides when we're adding two to three thousand people a year. That means two to three thousand more guides that go out to the community every year. And so um, we also would like to increase the size of those guides. Uh, the number of programs that we have, we'd like to be able to continue to provide more information about those. Um, this year we do have more utility vehicles to replace than we typically do, and so we have some additional costs for that. And then we also are providing for an allowance to, for the impact to go to, go to Dakota Golf as a result of the runway safety improvements. Um, one of the things that's difficult to predict is what the true impact will be. Uh, will they go play somewhere else? Will they play at one of the city courses? Uh, ultimately, what ends up happening to the bottom line for Dakota Golf? And so we want to make an allowance for that. Uh, but 
ultimately, until we experience it, we really won't know what the impact will be, uh, but we wanted to try to plan for that. Uh, and that will get a better understanding of that starting this fall, where we anticipate uh, construction will start soon on the East Nine. One of the other things that we do as part of our budget process is uh, talk about outcome indicators. Uh, one of our goals and outcomes is to provide recreational opportunities for all ages. Uh, as you'll see in, uh, on the column on the left, our recreational programs have fluctuated somewhat due to staffing changes in 2011 and 2012. However, you can see that we'll con continue to be pushing close to 200 programs on an annual basis this year and next year. We also track the number of program offerings reaching enrollment capacity. You'll see that we dipped down in 2012, and that is largely due to increasing the number of available registrations within, within each program. So for example, if we have a registration program for um, uh, prin princess costumes at the community center, well, if we had a uh, registration capacity of 12, and we're finding that we had a hu huge demand for that class because it fills up all the time, we may have doubled the uh, allowable registrations, and so we may not be meeting that maximum capacity registration either. And so we did do that in some of those cases, but the key measure is enrollment capacity and not necessarily total participants. What we're saying is that we believe we're serving as many or as more people as we have in the past. We're just not hitting those maximum enrollments that we had previously set in previous years. One of the other things we want to do is provide a safe, functional, and aesthetically pleasing park system. Uh, we want to mow all park areas weekly and inspect all park areas for litter, litter daily from Memorial Day to Labor Day. And we're achieving that goal now and plan to, do, to achieve that in the future. And then the other thing we track is that how does our percentage of parkland compare to the total city limits? And uh, you'll see that 6.7% uh, is what uh, we achieved in 2012, and we think that's a good goal going forward to, to maintain that. The other thing we'd like to be able to do is enhance customer service and user satisfaction. Um, we can continue to get good marks for the quality of our recreational opportunities at 69% that said they were either good or excellent. And one of the things we think of is that, well, is that a good mark or a bad mark? Are we about where we should be? And so what we do is we compare that to the national average and the 69% that we currently are achieving in 2012 is above the national average when compared to other cities. And for 2014, we'd like to push ourselves and try to get to 75% uh, goal there. The other thing we do is uh, ask folks uh, that what they think about the quality of our park system and to state whether it's good or excellent. Um, in 2012, the, the results were 93%, and obviously we want to maintain <clears throat> that high level. Uh, as it relates to the national average, this score is well above the national average, as you can probably imagine. So we want to continue to maintain that. With that, I'd be glad to take any questions you might have. Are there any uh, questions for Director Kearney? Yes, Kermit. Uh, yes, Don. Um, I was interested in what you had to say about the indoor pool, about the outdoor pool at Spellerberg Park. Um, if the vote goes for an outdoor pool, uh, what is the timeline for building that? Currently, the capital program does not have dollars allocated for an outdoor uh, facility at Spellerberg. And certainly, if uh, that is a direction that uh, the council wants to head, we'd have to allocate resources to, to be able to fund that. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm wondering why we're spending a lot of time talking about an indoor pool. We have no talk about an outdoor pool. When we have a vote coming up on April 8th, when nobody knows what the, the result will be. That's, that's true. Um, the thing that I would tell you is that we, our recommendation in the capital program is really largely based on the aquatic facility master plan that was recently com completed. And obviously based on those recommendations, as I stated earlier, the other thing too, that we obviously have been working to uh, build an indoor aquatic center, uh, largely based on the needs assessments that have been conducted over the years that uh, indicate that an indoor aquatic center is a need, and not only a need, uh, but a need that exceeds the results for an outdoor aquatic center in our needs assessments. I, yeah, I have some other questions, but let me just say, I mean, that's all irrelevant. 
until the April 8th election. But continuing on, um, the, the discussion over having seven parks, I think it's seven new parks, isn't it? And within, what, a half mile of a neighborhood, is that? Half the, mile of every residence is a planning goal? Yes. I, I guess my concern is, is that, while that's a nice goal, when we take a look at the parks we have now, some of the parks we have now we use a lot. And I see lots of people in these parks, which is great. For example, like McKinnon Park. I mean, I walk past McKinnon Park practically every day. There are people there all the time. That's fantastic. Then I go by other parks. There's nobody there. So I guess my concern is, is that just having seven new parks, half a mile from every neighborhood, we should be thinking a little more about are there going to be people there to use that park? Because we do have a lot of parks that are not being used. Could you comment on that? Well, first of all, I would tell you that the parks that are planned um, are largely planned out in their five-year plan based on rooftops. Uh, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll wait to develop the park until the actual homeowners are there to use the park. And the other thing, uh, you know, your comment about uh, uh, some parks getting used more than others, I think that's, that's obviously um, uh, a reality that, that we go through in cycles. Uh, there are times where I think you'll find that neighborhoods will turn over. Uh, for a while there, we'll have uh, maybe not a lot of calls, not a lot of interest in a particular park in one particular neighborhood, but what we find is that as those homes turn over to younger families, then we see a greater desire and need to use those, those parks and have facilities. And so we see that quite often, uh, and it, I think it's just a reflection of the demographic in that neighborhood at the time. But one of the things uh, that we're pretty sure of is that it will turn over and it will change. And, uh, and so I, I do think people value them. I think it's uh, typically rated very high in our needs assessment. But people uh, indicate that that's important to them. And uh, we continue to think the half-mile service area is a good goal. Mm -hmm. okay. Councilor Stegas, if I could ask if any other councilors have any questions. Councilor Karski. Question. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Director Carney, I'm glad to see that we do have the, an indoor pool budgeted or planned in our in our plan. Regardless of how the vote goes next year, I, an indoor pool is a good plan. And if the voters decide next April that we need an outdoor pool at Spellerberg, then we can we can plan for that. But at this point, I like the idea of sticking with an indoor pool. My question is in regard to the the timeline post election. What from April to whatever date, how long till ground could be broken over there for either type of pool? I mean, if you had to go through the entire process, do you, can you estimate for me? Uh, What's the quickest we could be moving out there? I would think that because of the CMR, CM at risk process, because you can bid out those different packages, uh, it could be excavation, it could be utilities and footings and foundations. So I could see that happening in the fall when we begin to get some of those initial design packages put together. So it could be as early as um, April, it could be as early as October, I would imagine, where we could start some of that work. No sooner? Uh, it, it is potentially, I'm trying to be conservative on it, but I, I, I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. but I do believe that it's uh, possible to start work in the fall. Okay, thank you. Yep. Other questions this time? Councilor Anderson. Don, uh, you spoke about the funding for this, and or even Councilman Karski spoke about the funding. Now seeing that it's over a three-year period, why can't we budget it within our budget instead of doing bonding? Uh, right now, as I see it, last year we, we discussed how well the city was doing and everything, and now we see presentations from Director Turbach that within the next few years we'll be under that 25 percent in our reserve so well i think it's well i saw it going actually to 18 percent if you take a look at it for long range so i guess i'm questioning why this couldn't be put into the plan over a three-year period where we would be saving up for two years you know because we do have at least one year here now before any kind of groundbreaking is going to happen. Could, would it be possible for us to budget that over a three-year period during the build? 
You know, that's a really good question. Um, I would tell you that the dollars that we have in there, we've grown uh, since we initially, the 7.7 .7 million that we actually have in 2014 in cash that we would plan to use as the down payment, so to speak. Uh, as it, you know, I think that would have an effect on the overall capital plan for the entire city. And I don't know if Tracy would be comfortable answering that question, but I, I do think it would, uh, at this stage of the game at least, it would require some significant shifting within other department budgets and within the general fund uh, to be able to accommodate paying for cash, as I understand it, over three years, if I understand your question right. So I don't know if Tracy has anything more to add. Thank you. I think, I think Don hit it pretty well on the head. The, the one, one thing I would point out is that <clears throat> the, when we talk about reserves, we're almost always talking about general fund reserves. And the, the aquatic center is not funded are proposed to be funded out of general fund dollars. So I, I, I want to make sure we don't get the, the discussion on that uh, kind of intermingled. But the, Don's absolutely right. When it comes to the capital plan and, and the second penny sales tax dollars that, that are intended to fund the indoor aquatic center, to fund it over three years can certainly be done. The revenues will be there to support it, but we'll have to take money away from other projects that have been in the plan for some time and are scheduled for 15 and 16. So, I mean, if, that, that's the trade-off. You, you've got a certain amount of money to spend. You've got other projects, certainly, that are important that we're intending to fund with those dollars. Uh, when, when there's a gap there, that's when it's appropriate to use bond financing. So in this case, uh, we've got about $7.7 .7 in the plan. That would, would be uh, about 40% or so of the, the overall project cost, I believe. And the rest of it can be funded uh, very uh, reasonably, I would say, without disrupting the rest of the capital plan. All those, all those street projects that are planned and, and other park projects, um, fire stations, all those things that are, that are currently in the plan. So it's really just a matter of prioritizing, just uh, uh, as I see it. Thank you. I do have a question, too, if I might. Uh, Don, can you tell me, there's been a lot of talk, and we've seen it in the news, and if I'm not mistaken, it's somewhere in the budget here. But what about the blood run, city's contribution? I think it's around $100,000 that's planned. Is that planned in the CIP? Is that where that is? Uh, actually, we made that contribution last year as part of our operating budget, and so there are no dollars in the 14 budget for blood run. Okay. Do we have any dollars allocated for future for blood run? We do not. Okay. Good question. Kermit, St uh, Councilor Staggers, I believe you do have another question. Yeah, I have a couple here for Don. Um, we're making progress on the, the falls uh, along the Greenway uh, in front of the Hilton Hotel. And we own that as a city. But also, I understand we own the falls over here um, at uh, Phillips and is it 8th? Uh, by, by the North of 6th Street? Yeah. By our office building? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We own that. Do we own any others in Sioux Falls? Any we, other? Falls. Because oh. the other day, you know, I'm on Louise and I'm uh, proceeding uh, towards the interstate and to the right, there's that nice falls there. Do we own that too or is it privately owned? I'm not really sure what you're talking about. Fountains. Fountains. No, no not, the only other fountains okay. that I'm aware of that we own are the ones at Veterans Memorial Park, where we actually have them in the lakes at, at Veterans Park. Okay. Yeah. And, and then the one downtown and then the one at the Hilton. Correct. Okay. Yep. Um, in the past, we've also talked about um, summer workers and things like that. And um, I, I know one time we, we briefly mentioned about hiring private contractors to do this and I, I do remember you were saying that that would not work out very well as far as efficiency and things like that but I've had other people tell me to the contrary and then also this was several weeks ago uh, I'm driving on 21st Street it's a Sunday morning and there's somebody out working on the boulevard and I'm thinking okay why are we having the boulevard being worked on on a Sunday morning. That must cost us more money to do that. What, what's going on there? Do you know? Well, I would imagine it's a seasonal employee that you saw out there uh, uh -huh. caring for that. Uh, and so I do, don't, I don't they know get why extra for Sunday morning or something for doing that? Don't they probably get extra for Sunday morning for no, doing they do that? Not. They do not earn overtime. Okay. Thank Const you. 
Councillor Jameson. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Don, you ended your presentation with the uh, survey results of the 93% <clears throat> of residents stating the quality of the city parks was in good or excellent. That's, uh, that's just a great number. You ended your presentation, but I think that's a great place to start. I mean, that really tells a good story about you and your staff and the whole city's effort to maintain a quality park system. But it's just really good news to see it that way. I do have a couple of questions. Uh, the two dog parks, nearly 500000 each. I think the average cost of building a park is less than that. But help me understand why uh, those two parks are important. Um, the 500, where does that, how does that calculate up to 500? It seems like a lot. Yeah, and I'll probably need Tori's help, uh, our capital development specialist, to, to articulate the dollar amounts for each project. But uh, I'll talk generally about the need for dog parks and our, um, the feedback we received about dog parks, and then I can have Tori talk to the specific numbers. Uh, dog parks, uh, again, uh, I go back to the needs assessment that we conducted, is that they rank high as a priority uh, with the community. And one of the things that we've heard since we opened the dog park in Spencer Park was that we love the dog park and love everything you've done with it, but I'd love to see one on the east side and one on the west side. And so we uh, have identified an area near the, um, uh, within Family Park is another uh, location for a dog park. And actually, if you're familiar with the work day that the Soka Construction did for us, they actually started that project for us uh, to provide some fill to be able to level that site so we could have a dog park there. And then we're still looking for a site on the east side that would be conducive to, to a dog park. As far as the dollars go, I'd like to have Tori address those uh, questions because there's more to it than just chain link fence. Uh, and I think he can speak to those questions. Tori Meadema, Parks and Recreation. Um, a good majority of the 500,000 is to actually build the parking lots to service the dog parks. Um, there's also some irrigation that goes in. There's uh, quite a quite a bit of expense in electrical as far as uh, lighting just to get uh, through the ADA pathways uh, from the parking lot uh, down to the dog park and back. Uh, those are some of the big big costs there. The chain link fence is kind of a smaller a smaller piece of a dog park, but it's probably what everybody kind of relates to when they when they think about a dog park. But it's all it's all the the real service pieces around that dog park that really cost. How do they cost more than the average, just regular neighborhood park? Uh, typical neighborhood parks, we don't actually build parking lots oh, in there. We use okay. on-street parking, so you don't have the cost of the parking lot. And then we also, in a lot of them, we don't uh, actually put lighting through the park. Um, typically what we have in a neighborhood park is a playground, picnic shelter, uh, some walkways, uh, and a play court. So if you take out if you take out the lighting in the parking lot, it's probably pretty close. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thanks, Tori. One other Councilor question Jameson, for Don, please. if I could. <clears throat> Don, it goes back to the indoor pool discussion. The uh, if the uh, if the vote happens, the vote uh, is a yes vote for an it for an outdoor pool. I get all mixed up on these. Mm -hmm. For an outdoor pool at Spellerberg, where would you build the indoor pool? Um, obviously, our recommendations from our consultant to, was to have it centrally located. And, uh, and so I think we would just evaluate that along with the council as to what the next best steps are. And um, certainly, the, the central location is important from the service area radius standpoint. And uh, I think we just have to evaluate it uh, following the election. You don't have a plan B or a second option? Well, I think there are potentially other options out there, um, but I, I do think that it's important to also understand the, the methodology that it went into planning the aquatic facility master plan so that we can serve our community because the aquatic facility master plan didn't just speak to the need for an indoor facility. It talked about how do we serve our entire community the growth of our city in the southwest, the southeast, the northwest, how do we serve it long term, and where do we position our facilities so that we can try to provide the best coverage for aquatic services 
uh, throughout our community. And so uh, I would tell you that there are sites that were evaluated that were deemed suitable uh, within the aquatic facility master plan. And uh, I think uh, it's, it's somewhat of a new day at that point to determine where, where, the, where is the very best spot for that facility. Thank you. Kermit, one more question, please. Yes. Um, Don, in regard to the back to the dog park uh, and spending $500,000, and we got some explanation here as to parking lots and things like that, but, but I guess I would hope that maybe you could start looking for different locations for dog parks because Spencer uh, Dog Park cost around $35,000. And that's quite a difference between five hundred and thirty-five thousand uh, dollars. Spencer didn't. It was more than thirty-five thousand dollars. I don't know the exact number, but I, because I remember I tried to delete it, and it was around thirty-five thousand. And uh, I can, it's, I can, it certainly I, wasn't even close to five hundred thousand. This yeah. is just a little bit. I think it's somewhere in between there, but I can get you that number. Okay, yeah. Councillor Erpenbach, please. But didn't Spencer already have an, a, a parking lot? Existing. Yeah, it was, obviously that's the ideal situation yeah. because in an existing parking had distant, existing restrooms, plenty of space, uh, accessible walkways that we could tie it into because that, that's the ideal location. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, and, I, and if I might, I do know too that Spencer was added on to. The original dog park was, consider, was enlarged considerably from where the initial portion was, and that was just probably within the past five years or so, I believe. Yeah, and if you remember, we started with a trial basis dog park to see if it would even work. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, we learned that the popularity was strong, and that's why we ultimately built the, the one that's there now. Good. What we're going to do is move on. If there are any other questions, please, Councillor Jameson. Thank you. If I could, uh, <clears throat> the parking lots kind of got me interested now. The reason for a parking lot is versus in our other parks, we, you're adding a parking lot for the dog park because? Because uh, they generate quite a bit of traffic. Most people drive their uh, pets to the park and park, and without parking, um, you know, it's just necessary uh, to have it. Uh, because if, if I'm understanding your yeah. question, well, right, that's yeah. what I was, I was trying to figure out. You know, normal neighborhood parks, like you say, don't have the uh, parking because I suppose, like you say, more people walk to them and don't need. Yeah, yeah walk or bike, and then if you, if you drive by Spencer when there's no soccer games going on. The number of people that are in that parking lot, you know, you'll see 20 or 30 cars at one time in there. So there is a need for parking. And then as, as well, snow removal, would you manage that or would that be the uh, street department? We currently do some snow removal in the, uh, in the dog park areas and it's right by our bike trail. And so as we go through and do the bike trail, we typically uh, plow those routes as well. Thank you. Thing. What we're going to do is move on to the next one. If there are any questions or if you need any more information on this, please get those questions to us and we'll get them scheduled in one of our work sessions. Thank you, Director Kearney. Thank you. We're going to move in to the Great Plains Zoo. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Whaley from the Great Plains Zoo. And I'll have to figure out how to advance this. John's coming up to help here. Oh, it's good to have technical assistance yeah. here. Yeah, it's just this outside. Director level technical yeah. assistance. Thank you. I'm the last person. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Sorry for that, but now we have visuals as well as uh, a little bit of narrative about the zoo. And I think all of you have been out to the zoo lately, so thank you for that. We want to make sure that you come out and see this community asset. And of course, we're in the process of building a progressive zoo here in Sioux Falls. Um, let me just give you kind of an overview both of the facility and of our mission at the zoo. Uh, as you well know, we are a 45-acre park that exists in a public-private partnership between the City of Sioux Falls and the Zoological Society of Sioux Falls, which is a private nonprofit. Uh, and that provides a, a really broad portfolio of funding sources for us, not just city funding, but of course, private investment. Here you see our brand new gateway. Um, that helps us greet our now 251,000 guests a year. So that brand new gateway is really important because now we're engaging and welcoming about half, I'm sorry, about twice the number of visitors we did just six or seven years ago. So as you know, we embarked on a master plan in 2006, gained a lot of community input 
uh, worked with all of our various publics, including our staff and landscape architects and business forecasters, as well as the city council and the zoo board. And in 2007, you approved a master plan that included a number of very much needed improvements. Uh, in 2008, we used the very same footprint for the Asian cat exhibit, but really fixed the behind the scenes holding for tigers, which was incredibly important. That was a safety issue for our community. And so having worked on the back of the house, we wanted to make sure the front of the house got a little bit of a, a refreshment. And so now we have three endangered species, more tigers, snow leopards, and palace cats in that very engaging area. Then in 2009, we were able to do a project of opportunity that included no city funding, um, but through the help of our friends at hy V, we were able to take down the old stockade fences that were actually on their way down of their own volition. Uh, again, a real safety hazard for our community and not a very engaging experience in the old children's zoo. And now we have the lovely, colorful hy V face-to-face farm, which uh, came up in 2009. 2010, we brought online rare rhinos of Africa, moving these animals out of a situation that was not in any way appropriate in terms of animal management and also not very engaging for our visitors and created a new immersive experience in our African area. And then, of course, this year we introduced snow monkeys to our community. We are one of only 13 zoos in the country to have this very important endangered species. And all of these enhancements really work to build our numbers, build the people who come out and support our zoo. So again, our attendance is about 251,000 people who make these advancements possible. We now teach 46,000 kids in unique educational settings really throughout the four state area, including on site at our campus through zoo snoozes and zoo camps and zoo cub classes. Uh, we have about 1,000 animals with really no net increase in exhibits, just cycling out old exhibits that really did not work from an animal management or guest experience standpoint. And now we breed 18 endangered species. So that's really the scope of our mission. Um, in terms of budget, uh, what was put forth uh, by the Parks Department and the Parks Board was uh, the management fee of 1.334 million. That's on a budget for us of 3.670. Um, so that's about 36% of budget. Uh, as we look at history, when we uh, brought in our new administrative team in 2006 and negotiated our five-year contract at that point, the city's support was about 47% of budget, and now it has steadily decreased because we've had to grow that budget to accommodate all the real needs of getting into a place where we can seriously say that we're a great zoo uh, that meets AZA standards, that does things to the level that good zoos do. Um, in terms of CIP, across the next five years, we have 353,000 in the plan. Uh, in 2015, we have 203,000 for perimeter fencing, and in 2016, 150,000 for, uh, again, a really needed renovation of the Brown Bear exhibit, which is one of our oldest exhibits. Any questions? Questions for Elizabeth. I would like to congratulate you on a very successful event again last week. It was a pleasure to go. Thank and be you. There. I was so glad to have you there. Yeah. Are there any questions on the zoo? I do. See, technical assistance abounds. Thank you. I need it. Um, I'm glad you asked. This is a good slide to look at. It really shows what that attendance trend has been. Um, people are checking out our zoo. And so you're seeing that we're at almost double what we were in 2005. We were at 137,000 guests. Now we're north of 251,000. And numbers look strong for this year, even with our very sloppy spring, which of course affects all of our attractions that rely on good weather. Um, we've also tripled our memberships. So we have around 7,500 households, uh, which translates into 22 or 23,000 members of the zoo. We're very pleased with that number. Um, and we've also seen our educational offerings really double, um, more than double. And that's important because kids need to connect with nature. That's what zoos are for. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. If we have any further questions for you, we'll let you know, OK? You know where to find me. You bet. Thanks. Thank you. We're going to move on now to this third item, Washington Pavilion of Arts and Sciences. Larry Toll, thank you, sir, for, sh for coming today. Mr. Chair, Councilors, Larry Toll from the Washington Pavilion. Um, just to give you a little bit of an update on what's going on at the Pavilion, um, 
We have an arts and science after school program that we work with 16 different locations in the city. We go to every week there is school, we will go to every one of the 12 Title I schools, elementary schools, to do arts and science. We also go to the Multicultural Center, the Bowdoin Youth Center, the Y after school program and juvenile detention. That program has grown by leaps and bounds over uh, the last couple years and is really making quite an impact. I think I related to you earlier in the year that we had, imp we, we saw 33,000 different students and we did 20,000 of those outside of the pavilion. So it really helps us get out in the community and, uh, and then we invite those people back obviously. Other things we're doing, we've hired a consulting firm to help us work through some of the issues with uh, making sure that our patron relations and our business practices are uh, world class. Uh, most of the people that work at the pavilion have got their experience at the pavilion. So we wanted somebody to come in and help us look at what we're doing. Uh, I'd report to you that last, last season, our subscribers of our series, our six show series, at the start of the first show, was at tw we had 1,251 subscribers. As of this morning, we have 1,690. So we've really expanded that base and, uh, and are really working hard to make sure our patrons have uh, a great, we have a great focus on them and, and provide services that they want. I'm pleased to tell you our, our opening show, War Horse, will open on September 5th and 6th. And like White Christmas, the crew is going to come in 10 days early. Uh, they will uh, rehearse the show here locally and, be, and launch their national tour from Sioux Falls. So we're going to have an impact in this community of 75 people spending uh, up to 10 nights here in our hotels, eating our, in our restaurants and visiting a lot of the downtown shops. So there's a really significant e economic impact that is related to that and uh, this is a, a great way for us to show our city off and to outsiders as well. Um, we are working also with the city uh, to bring in a traveling show into the Kirby Science Discovery Center uh, on the 21st of September. Well, I shouldn't jump ahead. I will be in front of you at your meeting next week to uh, get, hopefully get your approval of, the, of a contract with the Field Museum to bring in a T-Rex named Sue, which of course has South Dakota roots and has never been here. So uh, Sue's coming home. Uh, we went from Sioux Falls to maybe now we go to Sioux Falls. Uh, but it will be a great show, a traveling show. Uh, one of the problems we had with this show and uh, working with the city has made it really uh, simple to, to solve this. Uh, her tail went up about 14 or 16 feet and our ceilings were only at 12 feet, so we've, we're ripping out uh, about 6,000 square feet on the fourth floor ceiling so we can get her in there. She's 42 feet long. Stan is really excited to have her come visit. Um, so that will be a good one. If you've heard of the David B. Jones Foundation, uh, Davey is a local paleontologist that has been heavily involved in Boy Scouts. Uh, they are a major funder of this uh, along with some other uh, sponsors, so it's uh, really going to make this a, a great opportunity and we're reaching out to all the schools in the area to let them know about it so that they have opportunities to bring classes in. Uh, Kermit, you asked some stories about the fountains. Uh, there's a new one, uh, actually a falls over at uh, the pavilion and that was put in by a Boy Scout who raised all the money, uh, did all of the work, uh, and Mike Suleiman who will get his Eagle Court of Honor badge at the pavilion on September 8th. We're really proud of him and it's just a great addition to, to the pavilion and to the city. So if uh, his, he is really a, a, a wonderful young man. Uh, lastly, I think you're aware that Scott Peterson will be joining me as a co-president on September 1st. Uh, I'm thrilled to have him with me. He will move into my office. We will share the office. We'll, uh, any email I get, he gets. Any phone call, he, we'll have the same telephone number. So we'll have a good opportunity to work together for some series of months up and, and then hopefully both of us will be able to take advantage of a little time and uh, knowing full well that there's somebody capable back home doing the work. As far as the capital improvement project, uh, we have uh, a number of building issues going on this year. We will replace the seats in the 
Cynodome. Um, I often looked into when we have a kid show when the symphony does their bus day at the pavilion, I watched these kids sit in the seat and they're always moving. I think I should really charge them more. They're wearing my seats out at a much higher rate than an adult would and that is unfortunately what's happened in the Cynodome as those seats are worn out there need to be replaced so there's uh, money in the project to do that. And then the rest of the money that we have in the CIP is based on the evaluation the city asks that uh, an architectural firm come in and evaluate and recommend projects. We are still working through that and that's where the rest of the CIP money will go for 2014. So uh, any questions I'd be happy to answer. Questions for Larry. Kermit, please. Uh, Larry, uh, in regard to escalators, um, in the past we put in additional money uh, for elevators and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question is why do we have to be talking about escalators because also right now in our society we're talking a lot about obesity and you know we meet ADA requirements and so do, why do we need escalators? Uh, the pavilion was originally designed with the theory that people would come into the facility and would move immediately up to the second floor and most of the entrance into the the Mary W. Somerville Hall would take place from the rear or above that. Um, and when you think about the Visual Arts Center and the Kirby Science Discovery Center, both of those entrances are on the second floor. So we, we, uh, some of our patrons struggle finding some of these locations. Uh, and so long term, I think it will be a, a, a really good addition and help the flow there. Uh, and as far as obesity, uh, there's enough. It, most people that are late are, are, have to park way out, so they're getting their exercise coming in, I hope. Good response. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for Larry? Thank you, Larry. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda is Public Works, the much-waited-for Public Works presentation. Mark, Director Cotter, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, it's, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity for us to present our budget to you today. We do have uh, our team here that can answer questions. I do want to just recognize them at the beginning. We have team members here from Public Works Administration, our general fund divisions and our enterprise divisions and also our financial analysts. So this is kind of the awkward moment for the team, but can I just have you guys stand and be recognized? All right, it's like so you've got it stacked, Mark. That's right. We are here to answer your questions. All right, let's get started. We'll first start with the general fund divisions of public works. Uh, today we'll present to you the general fund divisions along with the enterprise fund divisions. It'll be a summary of a budget of about $143 million. The first piece, um, those pie charts include not only the operating but the capital uh, programs that go with them. Starting at the top with storm drainage at 7.5 million. Snow removal and street maintenance make up the street division budget of 7.4 million and 8.2 million respectively. Engineering is 7.5 million. And then the combined highways and streets capital plan is 27.6 million. All right, our overview of Really what we intend to set out for highways and streets general fund division is to efficiently plan, construct, and maintain the public infrastructure, operate safe and efficient traffic control systems. Number of uh, transitions in technology are happening in this area that you'll see more and more as we move farther into 2013 and into 14. Um, having an aggressive maintenance program so we have safe and rideable streets. Having a, one of the first class GIS teams to accurately map everything that gets platted and constructed uh, in the public right of way across the city. And then one of the key features that will certainly enhance customer service internal and external with the volume of contracts that we do, it will be a similar situation that uh, police have to actually have a, a city attorney embedded with us. That city attorney will be in Public Works Administration but will report to Dave Fifley. Uh, city Attorney. All right, uh, just to provide an overview of the budget changes, first two, snow removal and street maintenance, again, uh, Galen Huber uh, leads that division. 
The increase for snow, re snow removal is 0.2 million. The increase for street maintenance is 0.6 million. And then engineering has an increase of 0.8 million to have a uh, combined increase of budget for streets and engineering year over year of 13 to 14 of 1.6 million. This gets further broken down in subsequent slides. Storm drainage that we talked about the other night, um, whether it be for the operation of the existing system or planning the design and construction of the future systems, the operation budget for storm drainage increases by 0.2 million for a combined increase in highways and streets of 1.8 million. All right, where do those uh, dollars go to? This is respectively for the street and engineering divisions. Um, the large portions there are uh, personnel adjustments that comes from uh, the changes that are required. Inflationary rates of fuel, utilities, and software. Uh, there is some volume increases in new preemption equipment that we need to put on the traffic signal systems. That's the, those are the cameras that are on top that actually read when vehicles uh, come up. Fuel and the one call system that we subscribe to, the volume of calls is going up until we ultimately take uh, increases in our one call system. Every time someone digs, whether they put in a, a fence, uh, one call s tickets get called out and we have teams that go out and locate the respective utilities. This is the final year to transfer all the light maintenance costs over to the general fund until we've, we've got that programmed in at 152,000. True up of fleet expenses uh, initiative with a new civil engineer for uh, traffic team to again more split that that work into for two engineers to do um, optimize traffic signal systems and ultimately reduce delay we're going to bolster our right-of-way compliance uh, area there's been so much um, private utility work that's happened through and across the city there are there are teams like mid american energy that normally follow us in every street project to upgrade their system but they've also um, they've had an infusion of capital that they want to actually add an additional 10 miles per year of upgrading their gas mains. And so not only was, was the existing programs aggressive, some of these companies are really investing in their, uh, on the private side, on the utilities. And so we need, we need additional staff to actually manage that, and that's where that right-of-way compliance uh, piece comes from. Aerial photography, just with the growing city, is one of our greatest assets is to keep the aerial photography and GIS um, as accurate as possible, and then asset management. We have today a, a system through what we call Hanson that's no longer supported, so we need to start transferring over to a new asset management uh, system. And then Snowgate allocation that we've talked in the past uh, is in the budget at 300000 That's provided there's a positive public vote. We want to make sure that you know that it's been budgeted. All right, some highlights for the new capital plan on highways and streets. We really have uh, these five key programs that, that uh, guide the programs that happen through and across the city. Uh, first of which is located in major street reconstruction. This is a classic uh, case of like North Kiwanis that's happening this year. It's primarily reconstruction. There is expansion dollars included in it as well since we're adding a center turn lane. Arterial street expansion, overlay and seal coating of asphalt streets, concrete pavement restoration and joint replacement and storm drainage improvements. Um, the, the odd part on the graph there was the infusion of the flood control bonds. Um, and so we've taken a nice increase over this next year to uh, further improve our street system. All right, we have a lot of text on this slide. I'm just going to highlight the first two bullets because we do have pictures of where all these projects are located. But we've listed Russell Street as a major uh, street program again for 2014 since it is a two-year project. And really our flagship uh, arterial street expansion project next year is on the west side of the city. It's 41st Street from the TLS Road to Sertoma Avenue. It will include um, both those intersections as well. Okay. Let's go through the rest of these. Here's a picture of Russell Street. Uh, project's going well. Um, and as you start to progress here into the final quarter of the year, um, we're going to try to get some work started on, on the um, eastbound lanes as well. 
Uh, here's 41st Street from the T. Ellis Road to Sertoma. Again, this is our flagship uh, arterial street expansion project for next year. A lot of traffic uses this. This is also our direct conduit to the regional landfill. So once these, this improvement is complete, um, many drivers will appreciate it. Uh, this is a stretch of concrete pavement from Lyons Boulevard over to Western Avenue that will have concrete joint and spall repair done on it. There's a new uh, school that's currently being built, new middle school, that is on Maple Street just west of Marion Road. Uh, in the future, an elementary school will come in to play as well as a park and a fire station. Uh, we have a small project planned out there to do a widening of that rural section road to create a left turn lane uh, to get them started and then over time uh, Maple Street will be expanded to a four lane road as it's needed. And then just north of Maple Street and Marion Road there's a, uh, there's a small bridge that we intend to convert uh, over to box culverts as well and so we'll get that uh, program for next year as well. A uh, downtown project that we're looking at for doing next year is the reconstruction of 2nd Street and if funding allows once we get far enough into design we'd like to also accomplish those intersections as well at 10th and 11th Street. Uh, this is A Street and Cliff Avenue. If you drive up there that's an offset intersection. Um, we've been um, waiting for that property to become available, that flower shop on the corner. Um, we were able to purchase that and so now we'll actually be able to go in there and, and make that offset intersection line up. There's a number of accidents that happen there on an annual basis and, and that intersection needs additional capacity so we'll be able to accomplish both. All right, and then our next project that'll be similar to 10th and Cliff that was done last year will be uh, 10th and Sycamore. This, this intersection's been deemed with uh, a number of accidents and it needs additional capacity, so this one will be expanded as well. I think Chad has this program with the DOT to bid in September of this year, get ready for, uh, to, to position the contractor for next year. All right, and then 85th Street uh, between Minnesota Avenue and Cliff Avenue, we've programmed this because the city will be improving Cliff Avenue from 61st Street down to 85th Street uh, in 15. And the DOT will also be improving uh, Minnesota Avenue from 85th Street down to the Harrisburg Road in 15. So to adequately manage the traffic, uh, we, feel, we both feel it's important to get this road improved. It's going to be a rural section road, so it'll essentially look similar to what North Marion Road looks like today. It won't have curb and gutter, but it'll be a nice hard surface that we can adequately manage the traffic that comes out of uh, South Sioux Falls and, and uh, Northwest Iowa that comes in and out of the city. Okay. Here's a uh, section of North Bonson Avenue that we've received a grant for half the construction funding and so we're working to bring that project forward as well. All right, and then just some stats on, on overlay blocks. One of the things that you'll see as you look at the overlay blocks is actually going down um, from a goal in 13 to the goal in 14, as well as surface treatment. And the reason they're going down is um, we're funding at a higher level, but we're into some of these more mature areas where almost every handicap access needs to be upgraded. Um, a lot of curb and gutter repair that needs to be done. Um, and ultimately, we're starting to see the economy with the cost of construction going back up. There's just a lot of work, and so we're seeing, you know, prices go up. So that's why we've, uh, we certainly would love to beat that goal every year, but we also know that as we go into certain neighborhoods, it requires very little uh, curb and gutter work and, and ADA accessibility work and volley gutters in some of the um, neighborhoods that we're into this year. It's extensive, and we're going to be extensive here for the uh, near term. Okay, safe and accurate uh, traffic control systems will be a number of traffic counts that are taken and movement counts and ultimately what that allows is just to have Heath and his team update the synchro models that allow him to, again, just continue to refine how corridors function at peak hour and minimize people's delay. And so uh, getting accurate counts is, is critical and 
adding the additional traffic engineer will allow us to take advantage of some of the new uh, information technologies that are coming to traffic uh, management. Adaptive traffic control systems are here. You funded the first corridor with the um, capital surplus. And so as we move into the second half of this year, um, we're working on bringing that forward for Cliff Avenue, or uh, sorry, for 26th Street. And really focusing on that area, uh, if we can, from Van Epps, which is just uh, east of Cliff Avenue, all the way east over to Highland by Rosa Park School. So more to come on that. This slide just gives you a, a picture of where some of the adaptive technologies are happening across the country. They're certainly into the more of the metropolitan areas. And they're, they're essentially like having a traffic engineer at every intersection that can look and see the traffic that's coming and anticipate uh, queue links and then uh, adapt accordingly to, to most efficiently move that traffic through the intersection. And so we're excited to see our first system come into the city uh, Heath and he's taken technicians with him to see how these operate and ultimately um, we think it's going to be a really good fit for a number of corridors in Sioux Falls. All right, snow removal. Um, one of the areas that we take great pride in in the city because certainly we, uh, we know that there's a very high standard for people to drive through and across the city during any weather event in this city and so we we staff it and we have the equipment and the, the materials to do that. Um, the estimated miles, lane miles, is expected to go up from 2013 to 2014 as shown. And then just to give you a picture of what a typical snow removal operation is, uh, it does take about 100 city employees every 12 hours. Um, fire, Parks and Rec, and Public Works really work together to staff that equipment. Uh, there's 37 motor graders that are either rented or city-owned, 45 sanders. We have 26 partners with the private contractors to assist us in moving the snow. And then we also have additional partners in public parking and police and fleet to keep us moving. All right, this is, our, this is the end of the general fund section. Our team is here. Do you have any questions for us? We will entertain questions. Yes, Councilor Aguilar. Mark, the $300,000 for the snow gates, is that for the apparatus itself, or are there other costs in that number? No, that is for the operation of them. Uh, there's, there's a component in fleet that they would be purchased, and that's in the fleet budget. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Anderson. Mark, you uh, mentioned one of the roads that we're going to be looking at is 41st to T. Ellis Road. Mm -hmm. On that expansion, uh, I've had some calls from the neighborhood to the south that are very uh, greatly concerned about the drainage out there. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, the preliminary design showed a couple different retention ponds are going to be necessary right along. Mm -hmm. 41st Street. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that a little bit? I can, if you don't mind me um, going back to that slide. Okay, right here. Um, the neighborhood that I expect that you're uh, speaking of is in this area. Is that right? Okay, that's not coming up. We'll see if right, just directly to the south there. Uh, there's the West 42nd, yes. Okay. Um, that West 42nd, thank you, Chad. Um, Chattel Point, we've, we do have two that have been identified out there, and so we've been buying um, some of those vacant lots and mature homes to accommodate that drainage. That's, that's a neighborhood that's not currently annexed into the city. Planning and Public Works have been talking with that neighborhood about the transitions on coming into the city. Um, but we've had very good negotiations with the um, property owners that I'm aware of that where we've identified where we need that retention um, and detention storage that they've been willing sellers. And so we are accommodating that because probably, um, you know, not only are those gravel streets in that neighborhood, uh, drainage is the second thing that comes up. Uh, they also have a very old sanitary sewer system that's leaking. Um, and so it gives them a lot of inflow that ultimately 
um, they have higher rates of wastewater bills from the city because of that. So they're they're working on that. They've they've secured about 60% of the funding through a grant to upgrade their sewer system. And then last, uh, that neighborhood does not have fire protection. Um, they just essentially have a rural water system. And so there's a number of things um, that as the city grows and we meet up against these um, uh, subdivisions that were started out in the county that there's this can be a large transition for them to actually come up to city standards. But specifically for the drainage, um, I think our team feels really good not only about the expansion of the road, but the um, the cooperation we've had with those property owners to actually buy the land and create the ponds. If I may. Please. Yep. Uh, and I understand along 41st Street, there's it's gone pretty smoothly. Yep. Uh, I know that area pretty well. Uh, one of the properties that you're purchasing in that is an area where it's been really wet. Okay. So that's why, and then once again, with the concerns of the neighbors along 42nd, and they're concerned about the cost of actually being annexed into the city also. But that also, when you told me about the fire protection, I guess that explains some more of that cost. Mm -hmm. As we develop that, are we giving them options on you know, extending the payments because you're looking at thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars for some of these lots to mm -hmm. be connected. We did. We had a public meeting. Um, we 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 had really good attendance. We had a public meeting right over, right off to the right hand side of that sheet at Rose, uh, Roosevelt High School, and and talked about that and said ultimately the city council makes that decision on the duration and that we uh, very typically do five year assessments when. You know, you'll often see Chad bring forward sidewalk assessments. We know that this is much greater because it involves streets, water, sewer, drainage. And so we said um, we'd be, we certainly would be open to um, offer them options and then present them to the city council, whether it be 5, 10, 15, 20. The offset of that is that they pay more interest. And so we've tried to balance that uh, with them. and. But we did also do a survey out there, and and we had very good support for annexation and full upgrades um, of the system. And so, and I would say we had close to probably 40% of the people attend that public meeting. So I'm encouraged. I, um, it's, you know, obviously we're touching them on the north and south side. Development hasn't happened on the east side or the west side, but it will. And so I. Um, I think planning's done a nice job really bringing them along. Ultimately, if they recognize to come up to city standards, it's going to cost dollars, and you'll have that um, final say on duration of time for them to uh, pay back their assessments. Thank you. Okay. I'll, I'll pass to allow somebody Are there any other questions questions? at this time? Okay, Mark, I have just one. You mentioned the flood control project that we have, and you mentioned, I think, earlier this year that we had to have a little additional build-out mm -hmm. after the last FEMA ex uh, uh, inspection. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that a little bit? And it's my understanding you have this budgeted in for next year. Uh, we do. Um, essentially what happened is that there was, there was a main project that was identified, and it was that most people are widely know as phase one, two, and three. Phase one was to raise the walls and the spillway that was done in early 2000s. Phase two is down essentially where Skunk Creek and, and the Big Sur River come together. Those levees needed to be raised by five feet and construct the dam all the way south of 229. That's essentially done. And then phase three was raising the levees uh, all the way around the diversion channel around the airport. That's done. And so the Corps of Engineers got all that work done, and that's been planned for a number of years. Then they have a second team come in, it's called their certification team, that starts to certify that the work has been done in, in accordance with their standards. When they were doing those inspections, they identified structures uh, that needed to have some level of upgrade. And when I say a structure, that's usually a pipe that drains a local neighborhood through the levee into the river. And so there's a structure there because there, there has to be a way to put a gate down and close it in case the river level is running high so it doesn't actually backflow and flood a neighborhood. There was an initial structure identified that needed to be upgraded, and that's right by the zoo, and that bike trail has been closed and people are using a, a detour now. There is a few more. I think there's like nine more structures. Probably two affect the main bike 
trail loop. So we've hired a local consultant to accelerate that design um, and hopefully go to market yet this fall so we can do that work some in the fall and early spring. We believe that that's, that's going to complete the full suite of any of those minor structure improvements. Some of them are simply just relining a pipe to give it its structural strength back. Some of them are complete removals. Um, the bond funds that you've authorized years back in 2009 are sufficient to finish that work. And we are working to bring the Corps of Engineers uh, before you in about a month. Right now we're working with um, Lori right now, I think around September 17th, to give you a full update on the flood control project. And so just more to come. There, the team out of Omaha that we work with at the Corps of Engineers are very good. And so we're excited to bring them forward to you. Great. Good. Any other questions? Yes. Regarding that flood project, Mark, I understand that um, the mapping process can take a considerable amount of time. We're waiting for FEMA. I know of at least one other community that actually paid the mapping cost just so they could get it done. And this has added a huge expense to a lot of property owners, business owners, residents, mm -hmm. um, just because we're going to have to wait now. We've got it all done. We paid for it. Now we got to wait for them to come and say that we did the maps are okay and updated. I mean, we could save a couple of years if we did this. Is, has that been discussed at all? You know, I'm not, I'm not aware that you can actually do the role of FEMA. Um, and so if they can um, hire like an independent consultant like ICON to do the review that FEMA would normally do, because what our understanding is once all the projects are done, we're going to update the drawings to reflect what was built. Um, then there's operation manuals that are currently being wrote to uh, communicate how to operate the, the system. Um, and the dams. Once the drawings and the operational manuals go in, then FEMA can take up to 24 months to do the review and then ultimately say um, it meets their standard. I'm not aware that of any community that's actually done that, so if you have that name, I would like to reach can out get to them. that to you, yes. And, you know, we're at the, I guess, time of the federal government funding those types of projects to be done. And again, if we could fund it just so we can get it done for the benefit of our community, for the benefit of our taxpayers, I think that would be a good idea. Right. And I think we do need to look at that. So I'll get, I'll talk to you about that. Will do. Thank you. Rex, please. Yes, Mark. Um, a little bit off subject, uh, but I'm, I'm a little concerned about traffic around the, um, around the new Costco that's going to go in. I know we've been, you've d we've done the traffic studies and mm -hmm. we've done that. Um, and we've got the, um, the apartment complex that's going to go up all around it and things, but I'm still a little concerned because I drive down every once in a while down 41st Street and then I do everything I can to avoid it um, because of that. So a lot of times I will sneak in behind there on 49th Street. So I'm wondering about the 49th Street um, uh, project and if, that, if, if anybody's given it any thought about moving that up a year or two so that we can take some of the, some of the strain off of, out of off of uh, 41st Street, especially with that Costco uh, going to be opening up here this fall, and and uh, we can move some traffic down that way. Right. Um, well, there's a number of discussions that always happen about 49th Street because it's been a project that started to get designed in 2000. The intent at that point in time was there's still life in those bridges left, so let's try to do a design that ultimately gets more life out of those bridges. Well, that's 13 years ago. Um, we're currently... Um, I wouldn't recommend extending 49th Street um, to Minnesota until the interchange of Minnesota and 229 gets built to handle it. Right now, that intersection's not signalized, and if you're there at, at uh, either noon or at rush hour, you're not going to move unless you're taking a right turn. Um, but what I will say is that the DOT and the city are currently studying all the interchanges of 229. It's called the Major Investment Study. So if you're on the UDC of CCOG, you're going to be getting updates on that. That will actually identify what improvements can and should be done to that interchange. Um, and then we'll time 49th Street behind it. I think the, the discussion that we have is that, is there an opportunity to construct 49th Street from Grange Avenue back to Western and get some relief for that area? We've captured most of the right-of-way. And so we are thinking about moving that section up. And so 
Um, the traffic study initially said it will operate at acceptable levels at 41st and Grange. We're going to obviously monitor that, but we do have an opportunity to build at least a portion of 49th Street from Grange back to the west, and I think that'll actually uh, that'll address some of the issues. Yeah, that would. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Kenny, did you have a question, please? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mark, uh, last uh, uh, earlier this year, the council uh, took some of the money that was left over from the year before for ADA uh, improvements or to at least get us caught up. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I'm showing in here, well, and in your presentation, you talked about, you know, more ADA improvements. Are these new improvements or are, is this something that we didn't cover over you know, when we were using that additional money? No, there's, um, we stated that in the presentation that we really, I think there was an infusion of about 375,000 in addition to our existing program this year. And so that, uh, that certainly bolstered the program this year. And then over time, which we think it's about three years, we'll get through all those ADA ramps. We picked the highest concentrated ones to apply that additional funding to this year. And then ultimately, we'll, we'll get through that area. We've worked with Colleen Moran with the um, Human Resources uh, Commission, and she's very, she's happy with that approach. Uh, that's very aggressive. You know, the park system in Sioux Falls uh, is, I think, ahead of the curve. They, they really have upgraded their pedestrian accessibility throughout their parks. And so, um, and then, too, if we have an issue, if, say, someone calls into engineering into Chad's office and says, you know, this is, a, this is a high frequent route, we can look at how those work and potentially add those in any given year. So we're always working with the public to try to remove all those obstacles, but it was going to be about a three-year period uh, in addition to the extra funding that you provided this year. And one last question. One more, please. Yeah. Uh, 85th, Cliff to Minnesota. Right now, that's, uh, I believe, gravel. It's gravel. Uh, what are we actually going to do there? Are we just going to pave it so that we allow tra better traffic there, or it are is. we going to actually just uh, really put in a street there? We're just going to pave it. From a funding standpoint, we've identified a million dollars to grade it and pave it. Um, you know, we're at the very limit of the sewer ability, so we don't expect development as we start to move east to go south of 85th Street. So it's really only for crossed uh, traffic, and, and I would expect that we'll get, um, you know, we'll get a decent service life out of that asphalt, and it's critical for us the fact that we really need to improve Cliff Avenue from 61st through 85th Street in 15, and the DOT is going to improve Minnesota Avenue for three miles to the south, and it's, it's it's going to be vital for us to accomplish both those projects. And ultimately, um, I know even after those projects are done, people are going to use that stretch. But it, we, in the absence of sewerability south of it, a rural section road will suit it fine, and we'll get a lot of value out of that, uh, those dollars. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Why don't we move on to the next section then, Mark, please? All right. Let me advance back. All right, second section is our enterprise funds. And again, our team, both general fund and enterprise funds, work very hard every day to meet the needs of our customers and are constantly uh, looking forward to um, be ahead of those um, respective needs. First of all, the budgets are based, as you know, on cost of service rate models. Uh, you requested that we bring forward their rate models on a two-year cycle, and so in 2014, we'll actually be in the second year of that two-year cycle uh, for those respective utility rate adjustments. Um, both teams have proactive, uh, all four teams have proactive capital improvement plans and that were heavily regulated by state and federal requirements. All right, give you a breakdown. This is the other portion of our budget on the enterprise side, 84.4 million is uh, broke down with sanitary landfill, 9.7 million. Water is 37.9 million. Water reclamation is 28.1 million. And electric light is 8.6 million. First is light and power, and these are very summarized slides. Um, you know, the key is they, we have just about 2,500 customers, and we want to make sure that we provide them reliable service every day. And they also maintain the public lighting of all the public streets and pedestrian areas. 
Light and Power's breakdown of their $8.6 million budget is $1 million is in personnel. Other operating, which is the primary cost, is to purchase power for the customers is $6.8 million, and then capital is $0.8 million. This enterprise fund does not have any debt um, and is very well run by uh, Mike Burkhart. A couple of projects that uh, show up in the capital plan is unforeseen electrical systems. These are systems that are subject to all uh, weather, and so we've got to fund those as they come up. There's certain projects like the picture that's on the left, which is a circuit improvement project um, to improve some, in some respects, remove the overhead power in backyards, move them back onto a public street so access is better, and also upgrade the system. The, um, the center section is to uh, improve a major circuit that comes into the substation. The third picture off to the right that's got the black line drawn around it, we have a lot of our materials that are outside, and that's common, but we want to pave that area, uh, make it more accessible for the teams, and so we're planning for that. That picture in the upper right is a new transformer that's at the event center. That's a new customer for Light and Power. Next team is Sanitary Landfill, run by Dave McElroy. All right. Um, provides the MSW and C&D disposal for the five-county area. Uh, we've got a new sustainable um, uh, sustainability coordinator that you'll hear about. And you've seen a, uh, an email earlier this week from the mayor about some of the improvements that the haulers are making across the city. And then also um, with a number of byproducts that come out of the landfill, i.e. the tree removal this last year, all those trees, the nearly 40,000 tons of trees that were picked up across the city are being ground and, and being used as an energy source. Okay, breakdown of the landfill's budget of 9.7 million, 2.2 .2 is personnel, other operating is 5.6 million, capital is 1.3 million, and uh, debt service payments of uh, 0.6 million. A couple of the key projects, uh, first and foremost, the C&D Material Recycling Recovery Center. Our team has toured a number of them in a typical construction dumpster. A number of those items, up to 75%, can be recycled and sold in secondary markets, wood, metals, uh, cardboard. And so um, the, probably the closest one is in Shakopee, Minnesota. But long term, you know, the goal is to divert that so you're not burying it. And, and ultimately save all that airspace in the landfill so you can actually dispose of municipal uh, waste. Leachate, phytoremediation remediation, that's essentially the, the picture that's off to the lower right. That's when uh, you utilize that leachate, that's the liquid that's in a landfill, either comes in naturally with the waste or is percolated through with uh, rainwater. But it is a uh, contaminated water, if you will, that needs to be treated. Um, today it gets treated and then trucked to the wastewater treatment plant. Our goal is to use more of that on site, keep an optimum moisture content of the garbage to generate landfill gas, but also um, you can neutralize some of that contaminated uh, leachate and treat it using um, certain types of plants. And so Dave is very uh, uh, always pushing the envelope, and so that will be something that we look into further. Uh, and then uh, leachate recirculation systems, gas collection systems, and land acquisition is uh, key projects that are always in the budget to uh, look at additional buffer. Um, new sustainability programs. Bob Kappel has really uh, done a lot of effort over the course of the last two years on sustainability. We've just recently hired a new sustainability coordinator uh, doing very good things. You're going to start to see this, um, see more things come out. but. Um, one of the things today that happens at the Household Hazardous Waste Facility, that's only permitted for residential use. We've had some companies across the city that have asked, why can't I bring my business waste there? And essentially the answer is it's not permitted to do so. But what we, what we did last year, we did a pilot program where the company that manages our Household Hazardous Waste Facility can essentially come into town with trailers um, either to um, centralized areas or to specific companies, they can um, palletize it there and put it right in their trunks and it doesn't have to run through our permit. 
we've essentially agreed to pay the mobilization for that to see through the pilot program if there's enough of a need there um, because ultimately we want to divert that hazardous material out of the landfill. So more to come on that. Um, citizens pledge, green pledge, just um, trying to get a, uh, you know, numbers, hundreds of people committed to saving energy, uh, conserving water, uh, diverting waste, and so much more to come on that. And then in 14, we expect to do more on the commercial side for business to certify green businesses. And if you've listened to the radio, seen some of the new um, uh, radio ads with Recycling Randy and uh, all those new ones, it's uh, just taking steps to advance conservation measures. Water. All right, things are going really well at water. Greg Anderson manages the water division, and again, just trying to make sure that we meet the needs of our customers on a daily basis, uh, deliver high quality drinking water, promote sustainability practices. We are going to add a water program specialist. That's a recommendation in our budget. It essentially allows us to do two things, um, really centralize the water conservation and rebate program into one person as opposed to it's today it's in three different areas of public works. And then secondly, we've got a local company that's managed our leases for, on towers um, that when a communication company like Verizon wants to put a communication system on one of the water towers, they, they'll go through this third party that we've hired um, and then they'll work out the details and ultimately our arrangement with them has been that we pay them $3,600 a month uh, for the service and then we share in half the revenue. Um, most of this work has gotten very streamlined um, and also we would expect a, um, to improve the program. We can see a net benefit after we hire this individual in revenue of, of $159,000. And so there's a significant revenue component that comes with uh, leasing out our towers. We feel like we can do it and do it very well and also save the utilities, uh, not only dollars, but it'll be an additional revenue of nearly 160,000 after this person's brought in. So we think it makes very good business sense. So there'll be two functions that that new water program specialist does. Um, continue, and I know, I think we're gonna come before you in October to the Public Services Committee to talk about uh, water conservation philosophy at the request of Councilor Staggers. And then also uh, as we develop and set rates to maintain a sound water utility fund. All right, the breakdown of the $38 million budget is 6.1 million in personnel. Other operating is 11.1 million. Capital is 11.1 million. And the debt service payment uh, is 9.7 million. All right, a couple of key projects. Um, we're doing some building improvements. Last year with, the, um, with an amendment, we advanced uh, a project forward to do the design, and it's addressing um, several facility uh, needs. And so we'll bring those forward in 2014. Um, key facility flood protection uh, around the West Reservoir, uh, water distribution, growth and repair, the city's growing. Uh, and also we've uh, put additional about a half million dollars into um, more aggressively repairing our water uh, uh, mains. And then also following behind the engineering program with street, major street reconstruction is the primary uh, areas where this capital plan is funded to. Water reclamation, we're almost wrapped up. Um, water reclamation overview. The key is we certainly want to provide uninterrupted wastewater service, maximize sustainable opportunities. Um, an additional employee that we've been planning for, for uh, uh, in the recent years is to bring in someone that really will focus on the FOG program, which is removing fats, oils, and grease from the system. One of the primary areas that you'll get uh, in the system for backups is and overflows is when you have industries that don't have a good fat soil and grease program, goes down the system and ultimately can cause, cause uh, uh, backup services to a neighbor. And so uh, getting more aggressive on education and enforcement with fat soils and grease is going to be key. The other benefit of this is that with a capital improvement at the plant, more fat soil and grease will be coming to the plant. We can actually generate biogas from that. And today we, we generate about 30% of our own power out there 
by the methane that comes off today's wastewater. If you feed in a higher stream of, of fat soils and grease, that number will only go up so we can, again, become more sustainable. There's about a half million dollars that is spent every year in electrical costs at the wastewater plant that we look forward to reducing. And then again, just like water, uh, ensure that we have a sound uh, financials in this water reclamation system to meet the needs of today and in the future. A breakdown of the $28.2 million budget is $4.7 million is in personnel. Other operating is $5.8 million. Capital investment will be $7.6 million and debt service is $10.1 million. One of the key uh, components of paying that debt back was advancing all the respective projects that you've been a part of uh, in recent years, especially since the collapse in 2010. We just bid the last project that will complete the entire um, a sewer system that starts at the falls all the way down to where Brocco's is at. And so that project, the last $3 million investment was just bid. Now we'll start looking at the outfall, the Brandon lift station, and ultimately in the future as the east side grows, um, the largest capital investment will come when we build the second wastewater treatment plant. We expect that's beyond the, uh, that's in the future, but um, we are starting to, we have captured the land for it and we'll continue to keep our eye on it. All right, um, key projects, Sioux River South Interceptor improvements, that project just got bid. Uh, the fat soils and grease receiving and processing improvements that will be incorporated at the plant, um, always being aggressive on relining uh, existing pipes, and then also following the arterial street expansion programs to make sure that the utilities under those streets are sound when the roads are rebuilt. And then fleet, this is, fleet is an internal service fund that essentially uh, all the teams of public works pay into to adequately um, fund the replacement of their equipment. Um, we have a stellar team out there that is uh, ASC Blue Seal of Excellence Certified. They maintain over 400 pieces of equipment. They provide 10 vehicles for citywide use at City Hall for a motor pool. Uh, there's four fueling sites uh, throughout the city to try to make that as efficient as possible. And then equipment replacement, centralized purchasing of all um, divisions of public works. And then it is funded through what we call rental payments over life cycle. Essentially when a new piece of equipment comes in, say it's a $100,000 piece of equipment, the team may set a, a maturity rate of say 12 years on that piece of equipment. They put inflationary rates of what they believe the replacement will be in year 12 and then they set the rental schedules accordingly to make sure that those dollars are paid in over time to meet the need and the financial commitment to replace that vehicle when it comes. All right, uh, in starting in 2014, um, Fleet will begin to centralize its service uh, beyond public works, and the two areas that we'll uh, initially focus on is police department and urban management. Been uh, very good discussions, and we'll bring more, uh, more for you. Uh, as this uh, crosses other departments in the city. All right, fleet's uh, breakdown is 7.4 million, personnel is 1.7 million, other operating costs are 1.2 million, and a capital investment, which is primarily equipment, is 4.5 million. That's our last slide. Uh, again, our team is here to answer your questions, whether it's on general fund, enterprise funds, or fleet, and we'd be happy to do so. Questions for Director Cotter. Councillor Anderson, please. <clears throat> Mark, we have a pretty new sustainability department under Public Works, and we've come up with a lot of programs and uh, a lot of feel-good things. Uh, I'm working with the sanitary uh, garbage haulers and things like that. Um, but one of the things, as you know, I'm very interested in is when are we going to start uh, maybe taking a look at renewable energy. South Dakota stands, as far as wind and solar, uh, very high in the country for potential uh, usage. And what we've done out at the sanitary landfill has been just remarkable. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Aguilar and Erfenbach and I actually at one uh, seminar that we had went to uh, heard other cities talking about trying to do some things that we've already done. Mm -hmm. And you have a very talented staff here. Mm -hmm. So uh, is there any plans in the future 
to take a look at renewables to maybe help reduce the energy costs for some of our facilities that I see even in our CIP right now mm -hmm. talk about n the need of generators because of peak periods and uh, utilizing this renewable energy mm -hmm. to help reduce those peak periods for some of our city entities. Uh, certainly. I think, you know, the city has done a number of things over time. And I think just um, like renewable energy in the form of the FOG program is a good investment, something that's going to be there as we, uh, as all those fats, oils, and grease get brought in. And ultimately, we're going to be able to generate more electricity from a green fashion. Um, the air study that we did at the landfill uh, didn't come back favorable, at least in the short term, for us to move forward with that and make actually a recommendation uh, to build a wind tower at the landfill. I think that there's opportunities. I think we're encouraged that um, as you know, now maybe the production tax credit that's been extended again, if private companies um, have a good proposal for the city to consider, um, we're open. I mean, I think that um, you've certainly shown your support. We ultimately would like to, um, you know, get off the grid as much as possible. I think we can feel really fortunate that our, our light and power division, you know, almost half the cost of it comes off the dams today. So it's very good green power. And then our supplemental power provider through Heartland has one of the largest wind farms in the, in the state that we buy a lot of our wind through. So indirectly, I think that the city's doing a, a number of strategies. We may not be doing them directly, but we're with partners that are doing them. And so um, I don't have a good answer for you today about um, where it's funded in the CIP per se, but I think um, we've been open. We're just also waiting for, with some of the uh, rate structure corrections that we've had to make over the last six and seven years, um, that if something is uh, at least in the short term, um, expense high um, that we haven't we haven't felt confident to put that on our customers and bring that recommendation to you. Yeah. Well, um, I guess my only thing on this is that, you know, I I would like to challenge you over the rest of my term okay. that I'd like to see some of these things come up come up. Uh, you know, not only is it my interest, but mm -hmm. uh, my serving on the XL Energy advisory board also mm -hmm. uh, the Minnesota PUC mandated that XL has to increase their solar portfolio it does not have to be in Minnesota mm -hmm. so I mean there's there's a lot of opportunities I hope that we reach out and and to these energy companies whether it be Heartland XL mm -hmm. uh, and see what programs are out there that we could take advantage of now okay thank no, you that's fair Councillor Ruffing did you have a question please yeah, um, Councilor Mackin was trying to uh, get me an answer here, but let me let me see if I have this straight. <clears throat> you have a truck. You have a uh, in in let's say in in um, public um, whatever street uh, department. Street department. Mm -hmm. They uh, they get a they get a brand new truck that uh, we budgeted for them mm -hmm. uh, in 2013. And uh, the way I understand this works is that uh, Fleet gets it, basically, and, and leases it out to them. Mm -hmm. And they take, Fleet takes care of all the service and everything like that, does all the repairs, et cetera, mm -hmm. buys the new tires, et cetera, for it. Uh, and lifespan on that, let's just say, is, uh, is eight years and, or 120,000 miles, whatever comes first. Mm -hmm. Let's just say it's eight years. And during that time, they figure out what the, what the cost of that is over that eight years and charges your department the replacement that's right placement of it mm -hmm. at the end of eight years shouldn't fleet have the money to buy that piece of equipment new piece of equipment back for you and then why are why are or why is it in your budget and why are we being charged for that now shouldn't fleet in other words shouldn't fleet have this nice little bank roll over here they do and that's from the rental payments so maybe just from the rental payments maybe just one example that um, let's say it's a new piece of equipment that the that a particular division hasn't had whether it's landfill streets and just for easy numbers it's a hundred thousand dollars okay um, it's a hundred thousand dollars the the um, they have to make the initial purchase and then it gets put into the fleet system okay right, which which the council budgeted for out of general fund or out of C, or general funds 
operating funds to start you out. To, to purchase, that's right. right. And then over time, then we'll anticipate that maybe in year 10, that that's going to cost 150000 to replace. So then over the previous 10 years, they'll spit, split that right. uh, 150000 up into $15,000 payments right. for easy math. So by the time that that comes into play, that there's funds available in that department to replace that vehicle. Now there's also a surplus value that may come from that truck. That when you have the city auction in, you know, we may get $25,000 for that truck or $45,000 for that truck when it gets ultimately surplused. And so it's always, it's a, uh, it's a somewhat of a fluid business as you fund that. But the intent is once you, once you have that system in place um, and the right rental payments, that a division shouldn't have to come up with a large sum of money to replace it. It, it allows it to spread spread those costs out over time, and then when it comes to year 10, when they replace it, then they're going to look forward another 10 years, and maybe the rental payments go up to 18000 Yeah. But there's, it's a much smoother approach as you start to manage 400 pieces of equipment. Then why do we have in our budget costs for purchasing 10 or 12 new trucks? Is that over and above what's already in your fleet? That's actually out of the fleet revenue. I'll have uh, Dean uh, maybe give you a different take on it. Dean Borkhart with Public Works. I think I understand what you're what you're trying to get to is actually fleet is an, is an internal service fund. It is not general fund contributions that go to it. Those those payments come from the enterprise funds or the general fund divisions over a period of time for rent, but it is not the purchase of that equipment is then made with fleet revolving fund dollars, not with a general fund dollar uh, for the replacement of that piece of equipment. Then that, why are they in our because you still need to approve those approval. purchases so that we can make them uh, planned according to our 14 through 18 OSEP okay. plan. Okay, I understand, I understand. See, anything over $7,500 requires your approval, so those are still in our plan for your approval to make uh, on our equipment replacement, but they aren't funded with the general fund dollar. Okay, so it's just a funding thing. That explains it, thank you. Are there any more questions? What? Councilor Stegers, please. Yes, uh, Mark, this, this is actually a question dealing with the event center because I received a phone call just the other day and a, uh, a company had bid on uh, one of the projects at the event center mm -hmm. and um, well, they're concerned that they had the lowest bid but didn't get it and they wanted to take a look at the contract. Is there any way that city council members or the public can take a look at the, the contracts? Um, they can and, and we've communicated that um, to contractors as they've bid projects. They'll actually be subcontractors of Mortensen Construction, um, but there is there's an evaluation process that goes forward that looks at experience, cost, local, um, and as you weigh those respective factors, um, then ultimately we make an award, and the city's in the room with that as well. I'm not sure which contract this is, but I can certainly check into it for you. Um, and then with mill work. And what's that? Mill work. Okay. And uh, something else. I'm sorry, I can't remember offhand. Yeah, okay. Yeah, some of the last projects that we've had to bid is the mill work and the painting and then the signage will be next. Um, but it's a very uh, fair process as we evaluate bids and ultimately selecting the best contractor to deliver the project. Um, what we've always said is that they can talk to Mortensen um, to ask their questions. And then ultimately once we sign a contract with the selected subcontractor, they can actually come in and, and look at those other proposals of those contractors. So I would just, I would probably redirect them back to either uh, Mortensen Construction to answer their questions. Okay, and then Mortensen should tell them what happened exactly then? That's right. Okay. Yeah, there's a process when there's a proposal that they have to submit and then ultimately there's, uh, there's interviews that take place to make sure that there's, both sides have a good understanding of the work and then if there's any corrections, there'll be like a supplemental submittal that's requested of the contractors. And then we're able to look at them all in a spreadsheet and not only and select the ones with not only the um, as price as a factor, but experience, local, um, and manpower. So 
Okay. Thank you. It's a, I, I can tell you that I've been very impressed. I know Don is talking about using the construction manager at risk process. It's a very fair uh, way to make sure that you, you surround yourself with the right people to build a project. And so, um, and that's one, of the, that's one of the later packages that we've recently bid. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yes, Michelle, please. I, I have a question that's not actually not related to this. If we're ready to move beyond this and just wrap up the meeting, I have a question, a general question for. Are Tracy. there any other questions, directly? Sounds fine. Go ahead. Um, my question is for Tracy or for someone from finance. Um, we looked at the Washington Pavilion specifically today, and it's included in our entertainment venues on page 73 in the master book. The entertainment venues include the events complex, the convention center, the arena, and the Orpheum Theater. Why are we not looking at each of those individually as well? It seems like we're picking on the pavilion. I mean, if we're looking at just them, I don't see them scheduled on our on our uh, hearing schedule. Is that something that we decided as a group, or did? Couldn't hear very well. If you look at pay, at the general, at our master budget book, it's page, I think 73 is where I'm looking. I'm looking at the convention, at the, at the entertainment venues as a package. It's not 73. Anyway, all the, all the entertainment venues include the arena, they include the convention center, they include the Washington Pavilion, they include the Orpheum. We only have the Washington Pavilion scheduled as a separate item to be heard in hearings. We don't have any of those other locations scheduled to be heard in hearings. And I wonder why that is. Did we decide that as a group? Or are we just picking on the pavilion? That's my question. Well, I don't think there's uh, any intention to pick on anyone. I, I think uh, the schedule is probably a result of kind of where the interest has been in the past. Uh, and that has been primarily with the pavilion and with the, uh, <clears throat> well, with the, with the Washington Pavilion, I know there's been uh, considerable interest. Frankly, uh, I know in some of the work sessions last year, we did have uh, Terry and, and Mike, at that time Mike Cooper was a liaison, come to work sessions and answer questions. So there's, there's certainly uh, uh, whatever you folks would like to see and hear, we, we will certainly accommodate that in terms of addressing those other budgets as well. Okay, I just didn't know if it was a conscious decision. I mean, one of the concerns that I have is that we continue to see our, you know, that um, entertainment tax fund growing at a pretty good clip, you know, 5% or 6% or whatever. And those budget requests are not necessarily keeping pace. I think we need to look at those more in, in, a, in, a, in a package in terms of where's that money going, what do we plan to do with it, and, and we're not really looking at that as a council. And I'm not saying we have to do it right now. I'm just saying as a council, we need to be looking at that as well, those, that as a total package. And we don't see the event center necessarily in an operating budget yet, but we're going to. And where is that taking us? And so I guess I'm just not as much saying this to you as I am to my colleagues that we need to make sure we're watching those numbers as well. And we're kind of just going, yeah, pavilion, great, let's go, you know. And so that's my little rant, sorry. Thank Any you. other questions? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I would like to thank you, Director Turback, and thank you all of you for your presentations that you made uh, to date. Um, we do have coming up. Uh, next week, we do have another where we have fire library health and I can't read my notes here. It's off the chart here. But anyway, we've got another presentation coming up. There'll be more about that. Reminder of the work session. If you've got any questions, please put those forward to the chair or to uh, Councilor Karski, uh, to leadership, and we'll make sure that we get those plugged in for another work session. Think about the other work sessions that we might have scheduled if we need to bring another one up. Uh, if there's any additional information, I would appreciate that. Uh, that being said, yes, Councilor Jamison. Is it appropriate to uh, make a recommendation for the work session that public uh, or parks and rec attend sure. as well? Sure, you bet. Is, Anything in particular you would like to? Just, to uh, I'd say specifically the uh, dog parks and the uh, indoor pool. Sure. Those two items. But then as well, I know transit is going to be a big part of our discussion Thursday, right? Uh, I know that last, a few months ago, there was a proposal brought to us regarding reducing some of the service levels, changing them in some way. And I think we had talked about it to some great length about having either some of the stakeholders in a conversation. We kind
kind of sent them back to do some things. I'm just, I don't remember it all, but I remember there was, so I'm hoping that they have some, some study work that they've done already to bring forward. Yeah, so, I think specifically, if I might, I think what we had really talked about uh, when we had that one vote was we wanted a more detailed plan as far as where we're going to be, what we need to do in the future. The preliminary presentation by Director Cooper gave us a longer view as far as how transit would be affected as we go forward into the future and what things need to be addressed. So with that being said, I look at this as being a beginning of the conversation. It may not have all the answers for this budget time period, but it definitely is going to start the conversation going. And uh, it's my understanding that uh, they will be there uh, to give us more input, but also to ask more questions. Okay, and I'm sorry, just add in finance as well for the uh, indoor pool discussion. I know Tracy sent us an email, and I think there's some good information there. So, Okay, thank you. Councilor Karski. On the uh, pool thing, too, I'd like to know some kind of numbers, attendance numbers. I know several of our pools are closing already for the year, have closed, will be closing this weekend. And if they have any numbers on usage and kind of what it costs to operate our pools, it'd be kind of interesting, I think. Okay, thank you. Any other requests? Councilor Anderson. Could you add Falls Park West to that list for the Parks Department? As far as? I have questions on that that I wasn't able to ask today. Okay. Thank you. Falls Park West. You got that, guys? Any other questions? There being none, I'm going to adjourn this meeting, and we'll see you back here at 7 o'clock.